It should make you feel proud of the fact that we are Indians. Now you look at temples in Southeast Asia. Many of you must have seen that. The Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat in Cambodia is the largest temple in the world, bar none, including the Vatican. Even today, if you go there, you'll be absolutely astounded. Then you built Borabudur. It's the largest Buddhist temple in the world. You go to, you go to Burma, in south of Burma, there are 10,000 temples in the Bagan district built by Indians. Now, these are all astounding facts which our history has not recorded. So we need to record this in our, in, our, in our books of history. Look at our own temples in India, Tirupati. Now, Tirupati has an endowment of $100 billion, by the way, an astounding fact. And then lately we've discovered the famous Padmanabh temple in Tiruvananthapuram, which I think all of you must have seen on television, which was built by the king of Travancore, where we still don't know how much endowment, how much wealth there is. But the king of Travancore is on record to say that Vault B, which for some reason has not been opened even today, I don't know why, has within it one trillion dollars. The entire Indian economy is 1.8 trillion. The king of Travancore, I repeat, has said that that one vault out of the six or seven vaults has one trillion dollars. So look at the large heartedness of, of, of Indians, you know, that we have done. But these facts, again, I repeat, are not known. Now, what happened after such a glorious past, such a brilliant past that we have? No other country in the world has it, not, not even close. What happened? Two things happened. One, the entire first industrial revolution bypassed India. So starting from 1780, which is the start of the first industrial revolution, entire technology gave a bypass to India. And two, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the British came to rule India. And Britain made sure that India continued to make raw materials and their policy was that the manufacturing would be done in Britain. Unfortunately, and maybe a little willfully, I don't know, the growth of GDP of India under British rule, you ask this question, nobody knows this, but we should record it, was 0.1% per year. The Congress had 4.6% and they lost the election. Under the British rule, the rate of growth of Indian GDP was 0.1% per year, which meant that India grew 10% in 100 years. Now, these are facts which I don't know why, but are not recorded. Let me now quote an American historian, Will Durant. Will Durant is the most famous American historian, by the way. And I quote from his book, The Case for India. He had come to India in 1930, before independence. And he writes in his book, and I would like to read this out for the benefit of his audience. He writes, India was a far greater industrial and manufacturing nation than any country in Europe or in Asia. Quote, unquote, Will Durant. India was the motherland of our race and Sanskrit the mother of European languages. She was the mother of our philosophy, mother of much of our mathematics, mother through Buddha of the ideals embodied in Christianity, mother of self-government, mother of democracy. Mother India is in many ways the mother of us all. Now, we Indians have not written this. I don't know why. Written by an American historian the most famous American historian in 1930. Then he goes on to add, I was filled with astonishment and indignation at the apparently conscious and deliberate bleeding of India by England. Throughout 150 years, I began to feel that I had come upon the greatest crime in all history. Look at the strong word that he has used. And this is not an Indian, this is an American writing and the most famous American historian writing. And that reflects it. If you grow at 0.1% per year, and China has been growing at 10% per year, it says it all. So we should be proud of the fact that we had a glorious history right up to 1780 or thereabouts, and then we had this tremendous two problems, which is the, the, the Industrial Revolution bypassed us, and of course we, the, the, the rule of Britain started. As a consequence of this, what happened? 
the per capita income of India now $1,500. Mexico, $10,000. China, $5,000. Singapore in one generation, over $50,000. I went to Singapore first in 1963. It was worse than India, I can tell you. I've seen it with my own eyes. Today, it's a developed nation which has a per capita income of $50,000 plus. And of course, the United States of America, $55,000 plus. Built in one generation by Lee Kuan Yew, who incidentally studied also in Cambridge 34 years after Jawaharlal Nehru. And he did it single-handedly. What, what a feat, what a feat. Today, India has 2.5% of the world GDP with 16% of its population. So we really have a, a severe problem in our hand. I really sympathize with uh, our Prime Minister Modi. He, he has a really hard job to, to do. If we had grown, instead of 2.5%, we grew 2.5% after independence because we thought that growth would be automatic. Now the British had gone, we'll grow. We did not realize the fact that growth comes out of serious economic policies and very conscious efforts. But if we had grown at 10%, like many Korea countries did, Japan did that after the war, China, Korea, Taiwan, and now China, our economy would have become $20 trillion, more than the United States of America. I reiterate, if we had grown at 10% post-independence, we would have become a $20 trillion economy. Today, we are only a $1.8 trillion economy. This is because we don't have pride in this country. I meet people all the time that says, you know, we are a terrible government. We have so many scams. I think the British should come back and rule India. And we should go back to 0.1% growth, I think. What a tragedy. So, Mr. Satya Brahma, I think we should somehow get this across that India needs to grow. India needs to have pride. And without pride and passion, there are two ingredients, we will, this will not happen. And we have so much to be proud of. I reiterate in, in so many speeches I gave, there is no country not even close to India. There's no competition. It's a walkover. Nobody has the kind of history that we have. We still, unfortunately, in our history books, talk about the 1857 mutiny. Can you believe this? 1857 mutiny when it was a war of independence. All right, but we don't call it the war of independence. We say it was a mutiny. Where the Rani of Jhansi died, by the way. Jhansi ki Rani at the age of 29. It's tragedy that our history books need to be done again. And I think we need to make a very serious effort to research all of this. It's all recorded somewhere. There are thousands of PhD theses can be written so that we can make ourselves proud, our children proud, and our grandchildren proud of this great country of ours. And this, I repeat, is so essential if you're going to get back to the position that Singapore is in today, where a per capita income goes to $50,000. Why can't we do it? We have everything going for us. I'm sure it will happen if all of you make an effort and we have the will and the pride and the passion. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Dr. Lalit Kanodia. I'm going to ask you to stay back. And yes, history is really intriguing, and we really forgotten our history for sure. And like you said, that if we grow at the per capita that you've said, we're going to be far more ahead of all the developing nations. That's really, really true. And I'm again going to call uh, Mr. Satya onto the stage to kindly come and present a moment to, to our very own Dr. Lalit Kanodia as a mark of respect. Thank you so much, Mr. Satya, for doing the honors. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is not just a high-profile diabetologist, but is also known for his tough stance on national issues. He's none other than Dr. Gaurav Sharma, CMD, Dr. G Wellness Private Limited. Dr. Gaurav Sharma is one of the India's leading diabetologist and lifestyle doctor. He holds the super specialization in sports medicine. medicine. He pioneered the art of bringing positive change in the lives of many people through his lifestyle modification program. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have a huge round of applause for Dr. Gaurav Sharma. And I'm going to invite him onto the stage to address on empowering India through innovation and social entrepreneurship. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, everybody can hear me. First of all, namaskaram. I, I have a privilege to actually stand and talk to you from here about something which is so close to my heart. Um, I heard, uh, would want to thank Dr. Lalit, Dr. Batra as well about the great things they have talked about, the where we stand and where we are going. And um, we have an extremely exciting history that makes me proud. But if we sit on this, I don't think so we'll get anywhere. So um, it's the time for India, but I want to take you a little bit uh, back historically uh, around 15 years back when I was in Europe. And um, I was trying to figure it out uh, where my life is going and what I'm trying to do. And I felt something where maybe you've heard this uh, saying, dhobi ka kutta na ghar ka na ghat ka. Well, precisely that what I felt. I had a choice. I, I, I felt embarrassed to hold an Indian passport. And I am proud to actually speak about it, that yes, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed by the fact that people used to laugh at us and say that you've got cows roaming around on the streets and you have people who do not have anything in life. Ladies and gentlemen, at that time, I had a choice to actually change my passport, become a European citizen, marry a European blonde or something and have blondes running around, have a great life, or do something to my identity because I cannot change my identity, I cannot change my feelings, I cannot change myself. And at the, on that day, I took a decision. But friends, this European person is not going to go and build this country for me. I have to go back and build a country. Today, when I travel to Europe and the US, and uh, I get invited by a lot of people, and they tell me, Dr. G, why don't you come to the US? Your concepts are so exciting. We would love to have you here, especially the Indian Americans. And Americans kind of jokingly say, excuse me, aren't we human? Why can't you come for us? But I say, guys, sorry, I'm building a country. I am building a country, and I want this country to be built by every person and every leader who's sitting here and is hoping to change the lives. When I tell people that, that this is uh, what I do, and this is uh, a lot of people have watched me on my TV programs, and I say, guys, let's do it. And you know, everybody says, do something for the country. For that, I want thousands and thousands, maybe millions of Dr. G's in this country who can stand on this stage and say that yes, we are here for a change. We are impatient, we are tolerant, but we will not leave a single stone unturned to change this country. Ladies and gentlemen, I am ashamed of so many things till now. It's nearly 15 years. I came back around 14 years back to India. And I travel extensively. A lot of people ask me, Dr. G, why are you traveling so much? Why aren't you in India? I said, guys, I am collecting the gems which India lost. I'm trying to study the technologies maybe some people have preserved all over the world. I am going to far distance, distant places where we still have people, some Europeans, who are, I think, so more proud. And they cherish the culture of India. I feel proud to look at them, that their love for Sanskrit. I'm proud to look at those people whose heartbeats and who are not ready to change or give up their values, just for a few points. We're living in a world, we have this government, new government, we are very excited about it, Mr. Narendra Modi. We are very, very optimistic that you can do something. A few years back, I used to say, and I, I, and I, I want to talk about it, unfortunately I didn't speak about it earlier. We actually had a sick government. Let's, let's go back, when I came back to India, a lot of emotions in the, uh, in, in the beginning of the century. People said, there are two countries who are gonna come out, 
the next few years, India and China. China has arrived, India hasn't. What went wrong? Why is it that we stand nowhere? And if you really want to check out China, uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Last year, it was uh, around uh, November. I was in uh, Shanghai. It, I think so. It was August. I think so. I was in Shanghai, and they have built such an amazing infrastructure, and they have elevated the whole city. The streets are normal, and from every direction there are roads coming, and there is an intersection which goes round and round and round and round around the river. And ladies and gentlemen, you know what I saw? I saw a policeman on a flyover. Can you imagine a policeman regulating the traffic on a flyover? I was there in February. Ladies and gentlemen, I saw traffic lights on a flyover. Traffic lights. Here, governments say in Delhi, where I live, uh, everybody from everywhere wants me to come there. But I somehow stick to Delhi. Maybe I was born there. I don't know. I have some special emotions. Maybe. I don't know. Mumbai is very close to my heart. But there are places where there is flyover from only one side. The other side, you kind of go down. And you have got congestion there. You've got traffic jams. You've got snarls there. I want to ask those people who are designing Delhi, what were they thinking about? Don't they think that it's easier to actually make a flyover from both sides. They were trying to save money. I don't think so because Delhi pays enough taxes in transportation. I don't know why this was happening. What also exciting, uh, you know, I look at the newspapers and I see who India has made, built or started the pseudo semi express. Should I cry? Should I, should I say thank you very much? You've invested 10 crores to actually build such a fantastic uh, railroad. 2004, when maglev was launched, the magnetic levitation trains in China, in Shanghai, which travels from the airport to the city. And it goes at four.